Okay, <coughs> good evening everyone. Um, tonight uh, we're doing another live stream broadcast uh, for the Surgery Registrar tutorial. I'm just going to be finishing up um, a little bit from last week which we didn't have time to complete on uh, hernias and then uh, we've also got the FCS two papers that were written on Thursday and Friday last week that's the 21st and 22nd of February um, I'm just going to run through the questions quickly um, I'd like some input from the registrars about um, what uh, they had uh, thought uh, the correct answers are. I'm not really providing a model answer we're just going to be discussing it a little bit and uh, then if there's time we've uh, posted uh, two um, viva type questions mm -hmm. Uh, these are operative viva type questions that I posted on the WhatsApp group and I'm happy to report there's been a there's been a good um, response so going to last week's tutorial we had uh, looked at a couple of videos um, we focused on the tension free repair with mesh and um, I'd like to take a look at a few more um, videos but um, we'll just give uh, people time to join we'll just see who's joined us already Okay, Manish has joined us. Welcome, Manish. Ravi is here. Welcome, Ravi. Let's give everyone one more minute and then we'll proceed. It's also um, a couple of articles that uh, I wanted to go through but uh, probably not going to have time. Uh, the articles uh, are the um, ventral hernia, hernia interest group uh, paper that was published in 2016 uh, that was sent to me by Dr. Ravi Naidu. Thanks very much. Um, I have uploaded that to Teachable and then a new article that uh, was sent to me today by Dr. Ismail Ibrahim. Um, I haven't read through it in detail, but uh, the diagrams and schematics look very nice. Um, it's an explanation of the laparoscopic anatomy of the inguinal area, uh, which I think um, would be worthwhile reading. We'll try and get to that if we can. Ismail is here as well. Okay, so let's just go back to some of these videos that we didn't get a chance to look at last week. Um, the femoral hernia. So the landmarks, first of all, the umbilicus is obvious, the uh, anterior superior like spine. Uh, down in the midline, uh, the first bony bit there, that's the pubic symphysis. You can feel along the edge there, that's the pubic tubercle. Now, she has a swelling hit down here in the groin, uh, which is below and lateral to the uh, pubic tubercle. Uh, that clinically, therefore, is a femoral hernia. An inguinal hernia will emerge medial and superior to the pubic tubercle. So there are two, uh, there's a number of approaches to 
sort this hernia out, we could do a low Lockwood approach. Uh, that would be for an elective case where we're not worrying about uh, incarcerated bowel. We are worried about incarcerated bowel in this lady clinically. She's been vomiting and her bowels haven't opened. So we want to do a higher approach. One approach is a midline laparotomy, which is a bit of an overkill. The two other approaches are the Lathiasen approach through the inguinal canal, uh, which has its own uh, disadvantages. If you have a look at the book. And the uh, approach we're therefore going to use is the modified McEvity. The original McEvity operation was a, a vertical incision going up from the pubic tubercle pretty much along the line, lateral line of the uh, rectus sheath. <clears throat> we're still going to cut the rectus sheath in that line. We're going to make a more cosmetic skin incision uh, lying about there. About like that. Maybe a tad lower. So that's skin and uh, subcutaneous fat. This is scarpus fascia, a white membranous layer. Cut straight through that to true fat. And we're looking now for the rectus sheath. That's quite clearly seen here. This white layer. clear off a bit of fat from there. So where is the lateral edge of the rectus sheath? Well the rectus abdominis goes up from the pubic tubercle up. So now we're through there we can make a, a vertical incision there. Uh, in actual fact I think you can probably see the some of the fibres there of the external oblique coming from superlateral super to inframedial and then uh, the rectus sheath begins underneath there. There's already a little hole there. Um, that's a good place to start. Just take that. We've opened the rectus, anterior rectus sheath. We can see this vertical running uh, muscle. We don't need to cut that, we can just retract that. So once we've retracted the rectus sheath medially, we should be pretty much on to uh, this level, peritoneum alone. Uh, the posterior rectus sheath is usually a bit, a bit farther above this. A couple of clips, thanks. Thank you. So in the usual way, we open the peritoneum. Some people at this stage wouldn't have opened the peritoneum. They would try to manipulate the femoral hernia back in by going extra peritoneally. And you can quite clearly see where the extra peritoneal plane is, right under there. So we could approach it that way. My feeling is we think that the small bowel here is incarcerated. The first thing we want to do is rescue the small bowel. So we can see some hemoserous fluid already coming out of this wound. Just take that. Whenever you have obstructed bowel, there's often transudate from the cerosal surface. So we've entered the peritoneum. We want to retract everything out of the way as much as we can so that we can get a good view of the internal opening of the femoral canal. You can hold on to that. You can see here some very distended small bowel and there's some collapsed small bowel just next to it. That uh, suggests something's going on down here. We already know there is. So I'm feeling down now into the internal opening of the femoral canal here. I don't know if you can see in there. 
puckered down into a hole here, which is the femoral canal. We see some distended small bowel next to it and some non-distended bowel there. So it's more by feel this. I'm just first of all going to try and feel into the femoral canal and just put a little bit of anterior pressure, so that's up on the inguinal ligament, just to try and open up the femoral canal a bit to ease reduction. Sometimes a bit of pressure on the outside helps. Sometimes you can dissect under the skin to this area. We might try that. So we're trying to dissect in the extraperitoneal plane. Sometimes works. We started that already, didn't we? So now extra peritoneal, you can see there's a <coughs> something poking into the hole there. Let's see if we can just reduce the whole thing. Okay, well we've reduced quite a lot of it. Let's just see if that was enough for the small bowel. There we go. <coughs> so we released the small bowel by the process of partially dissecting out intraperitoneally, a bit of pressure externally, and then we went extraperitoneally to help reduce the whole sac. There's a bit of momentum still stuck in, which we've clipped off, but that's uh, returned uh, into the abdomen. So it lo looks very bruised. It's still shiny. Uh, it's still peristalsing. And can I feel a artery in the mesentery I can. So this is a rictus hernia. I suspect this is probably viable. We'll wrap it into a warm swab, leave it in the abdomen for a bit and then we'll come back to it. Pop that back into there, see if it'll pink up. So whilst we're uh, letting the bowel uh, decide what it's doing, we can look at uh, repairing the femoral defect. Two ways of doing this. One is with uh, stitches and the other is with a mesh. In the presence of the small bowel being incarcerated in here, it's sensible to just close the stitches. If you can't reduce the sac completely, you can just amputate it extra peritoneally. We've emptied the sac going into that femoral canal but we can't quite reduce it. We know there's nothing in it because I can put my finger into it now. It's a bit of, bit of a momentum that we've partially amputated. There's the inside of that sac. So if we cut across that now we know it's only peritoneum. So there's the sac. The remnant of the sac in the femoral canal can remain there. This is the content of the femoral canal. Anteriorly is the inguinal ligament. Medially is the lacuna ligament. Posteriorly is the pectineal ligament. And laterally is the femoral vein. We obviously can't stitch to the femoral vein, so you can stitch anterior to posterior or you can insert some mesh in here. So pectineal ligament posteriorly. Inguinal ligament anteriorly. So that's obliterated the inside of the femoral canal. And a couple of stitches like that's a sensible thing to do. Often you end up just getting the tissue overlying the pectineal ligament. The pectineal ligament is pretty fixed.
It is a fiddly stitch to get. Again, there's the pectineal ligament, medially, lacunar ligament, anteriorly, inguinal ligament, laterally femoral vein. And we've occluded the femoral canal internally with two stitches. <coughs> well, that's looking pretty good. It's, uh, you can see it's bruised, but it's completely viable. So things to look, look for is, is, it, is there obvious black necrosis? It's bruised there at the top, but that's not necrotic. It's still shiny. Earlier on it was peristousing and we still had a pulse in the mesentery as you'd expect as any erictus hernia. The only argument for resecting this really would be is if you're really unsure, but I think we're pretty happy about that. And the other argument being that um, if you have an ischemic segment of small bowel, there is a small risk of it stricturing later on. But I think we're happy with that. Liver feels fine. Some rocks of stool in the colon. Stomach feels fine. Nothing grossly abnormal elsewhere to touch. We're going to close the anterior rectus sheath now. We've closed the peritoneum. The rectus sheath we didn't actually remove, we just retracted it, if you remember. So all we have to actually close now is the uh, anterior rectus sheath. Good big bites. So for uh, local anesthesia, we don't just want to get the skin, we want to get the rectus sheath as well. Remember all the nerve supply will be coming in from supralateral, running down. This continuation of the intercostal nerves. So we get within the rectus sheath, not too deep obviously. Do it both sides just for completeness. It's a very thin rectus sheath, this lady. Okay, we're going to stop there. Um, if there's any questions, please post. That was a McEvity approach uh, to a femoral hernia and uh, very nicely uh, shown. The femoral hernia is very difficult to visualize and this was done very nicely. Uh, good camera work. You could actually uh, see uh, the erectus hernia, um, momentum inside the femoral canal and then um, you couldn't actually see um, the inguinal ligament and the lacuna ligament, but um, he pointed it out and uh, you saw where the stitches went. Um, if there's any questions, please post it to the group in WhatsApp. Uh, we did look at this very brief um, tip video last week. And um, it's got a question from Manish. Um, Manish's question is, I do not understand the extra peritoneal approach part. Okay, so um, Manish, do you just need to be able to visualize um, this area. Remember that the peritoneum is now coming down on the inside of um, the rectus muscle and it then goes onto the pelvis and it curves. It's like a, like a bowl sitting in the pelvis. So the incision that was made uh, was to open up the rectus sheath, right? It was a transverse incision, but then the incision on the rectus, anterior aspect of the rectus sheath was vertical, almost in the middle of the right rectus sheath. And then the um, rectus muscle was retracted to the right. So at that point, um, because we are quite low down, there's no posterior rectus sheath, and we are actually on the anterior as aspect of the peritoneum, so we are technically extraperitoneal. 
Um, at that point, uh, the surgeon in this video opened the peritoneum and entered the peritoneum and he explained his reasoning for that in that he was um, concerned that there was bowel trapped and he needed to visualize the bowel, which he did. Now, if, for example, there wasn't a suspicion of either obstruction or strangulation, then it would not be necessary to enter the peritoneum. You could actually start dissecting downward um, anterior to the peritoneum until you reach the curve of the peritoneum as it starts curving into the pelvis. And at that point, um, you'd actually be able to I, I visualize the sac of the femoral hernia. And at a later stage, he actually resected that sac. So he didn't do um, much dissection in the extraperitoneal plane. He just went um, along that plane to try and apply some pressure and to uh, lift up uh, the inguinal ligament, lift it anteriorly. Okay, um, I'm not sure if that uh, explains it uh, adequately, but um, um, I think that's all we've got time for now. If you're still having difficulty with it, please uh, contact me um, outside of the tut. Okay, the um, <clears throat> other hernia that I wanted you to look at um, was the indirect uh, sac. Um, let's have a look at that video. This is a 75 year old lady with a left ingle hernia. Uh, she's been getting symptoms of discomfort from this and a lump. She's previously had the right side done. Um, ingle hernias in women are uh, less of a problem than men because they don't have the uh, spermatic cord. Um, we're going to start the operation now. We plan to put mesh in. Okay. So we've got the pubic tuber from this direction. Now you really need to get to it above us from above as well. Just tip, tip. Yeah. 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 You have two of my cool time. That stitch thing. So I do a continuous plication of that, starting usually. With the phone in? No, with two, not two of them. Yeah. Two of them. Look, you see the nerve really well there. That's the only ring of the nerve. So you, you either divide it or... But you can leave it be. Yeah. Right. The main thing is to come across immediately, yeah, so you're overlapping the pubic tube. down into the abdominal cavity. Bit of momentum trying to work its way through. It was probably that that was in the incisive. No. We haven't completely haven't completely dissected the proximal part of the sac away from the cause. We've just got a little bit more work to do. Right. There is the hernial sac dissected away from the rest of the spermatic cord and we'll just sling the spermatic cord with a lane's tissue holder.
bits to your shoulder fits around quite nicely. It's not bulky, it doesn't get in the way. Uh, it's got a nice long handle, it's fairly heavy, so it will fold things out of the way by its own weight. You can use a hernia ring if you want. We've got a very stretched internal ring there. Get a finger and a half in there. So let's get rid of the sack. There's nothing in it. We'll twist it off because it makes it easier to transect. We've dissected the sack well away from the rest of the spermatic cord and we'll transect it as low as possible. Don't try and just tie around it because the tie will slip off. You need to transect it. Transfix. Transfix. Now, that's under a little bit of tension at the moment. So, the first thing to cut is not the stitch, but to cut the sack. And do it yourself. Don't get your assistant to do it. You always just leave a little bit there, because you see that drops back inside. And if you cut the stitch first of all, and it was bleeding, you won't be able to pick it up and deal with it. And there's sometimes a little bit of bleeding there that we can just deal with. And then having done that, we can finally cut the stitch and it will drop back inside. What I'm looking for is the edge of the sack, so I can pick up the edge of the sack with a pair of forceps and we can see the edge of the sack just beginning to show there. This is quite a big hernia, it goes down into the scrotum, we're not going to dissect out the fundus, we're just going to dissect out the sac at this point, get all the way around it and transect it. Pick up the sac with a couple of clips. And we just need to manoeuvre off all the surrounding tissue so we've just got the sac isolated and we can do this a variety of methods, you can scissor everything off, you can use a swab, whatever takes your fancy, whatever seems to be working at that particular moment. Um, some sacks are very, very tough, difficult to dissect out. Uh, some are very, very flimsy indeed. And will split. You just pick them up with a pair of forceps, they split. Very difficult. I just want to get around this sack right the way around to the other side. I haven't completely got it isolated from the vas and the vessels, jolly nearly. just want to get around to the other side so that we can dissect it. Not quite the way around. I'll probably just finish it off with, with a swab. This is another helpful way of dissecting out um, sacks, just using a, a, a drum, almost there. Yeah. I got my finger completely round the sack. There's the sack, separate from the vessels and the spermatic cord. Now, can you just have some more clips, please? We're now going to transect the sac. We're going to leave the distal part of the sac in place. I'll show you where it's going in a minute. There is the distal part of the sac. It goes all the way down into the scrotum. I'm not going to dissect that out because it's just going to cause a lot of bleeding. We can leave that open. I'll just open it up a little bit more. So if there's any fluid in there, it can drain into the surrounding tissues. And we'll leave that be. We don't need that anymore. No longer wanted. And we'll turn our attention to the proximal part of the sac. Okay, that is actually a very good video. Um, if there's any questions, um, welcome to all of those uh, of you who are a bit late. Okay, so um, that's pretty much all the videos that I wanted you guys to look at. All of these videos are 
uploaded on the teachable.com website so you can look at them at your own leisure um, to close that up and uh, let's just look at these articles <coughs> this is the one article uh, the anatomy article and the other article which um, it's quite long it's a 32 page article it's written um, in South Africa by South African surgeons so it's highly relevant to us and um, some of the people involved in this article could very well uh, be your examiners um, so I think this uh, is a highly relevant topic um, and uh, the um, article as I explained is very long uh, you will should read it on your own time I think it's uh, up on the teachable.com website I did upload it um, if you have any difficulty getting it uh, please let me know um, basically you should read this in detail um, it's actually uh, fairly well summarized so you can actually just read it and highlight the areas and keep this entire um, article as a summary uh, that you can use for ventral hernias right there's a classification system um, there's uh, what they're actually explaining is about a new system to describe the hernias in different zones they've got medial hernias one to five lateral hernias one to uh, four and this is something you could be asked about in your vivas. Um, the decision making is very important to understand. They've actually laid out all the evidence fairly well in this article and they've uh, explained very clearly what is strong evidence, uh, what is moderate evidence and what is really just anecdotal or weak evidence. All right, now what you have to appreciate is that um, hernias are extremely common. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that um, prior to the advent of the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, hernias were actually the highest cause of death in uh, rural populations. So it's not that these hernias have suddenly disappeared because of the advent of HIV AIDS. The hernias are still there. Uh, and there's a huge number of patients with hernias. Um, however, the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic is far more serious and life-threatening. Therefore, people tend to focus on that. So um, it's important to actually realize this. And we must not treat hernias lightly. Uh, the policy that I have is that uh, all hernias um, should be admitted and they should preferably be operated on the next available list. This is not always uh, possible given our uh, heavy patient burden in both the public and private sector, but that is actually the ideal approach. The difficulty is that um, a lot of our patients um, live far away. Um, they might feel better and then they go away with the hernia not being repaired and then they rep return uh, weeks, months or years later with a incarcerated, obstructed or strangulated hernia, which is uh, obviously a high risk because you're now forced to rush in and operate. So your approach should be to explain to patients that they need to have this repaired. If you have bed space, admit them and repair the hernia on the next available list. Um, if not, call them in and make sure that they are not lost to follow up. Right, there are some uh, variations on that. Uh, for example, incisional hernias in obese patients, we would want them to lose weight before we would uh, want to uh, tackle that. Um, <clears throat> wound closure. Right, this I thought was relevant because this seems to be a shift away from uh, how we are all used to closing the midline sheath. We take a huge um, one or O loop nylon or loop PDS and we um, take these huge bites 
and um, this has actually been shown to be not as effective as the um, smaller suture use of a 2-0 needle it still should be non-absorbable monofilament um, and uh, you should actually take smaller bites uh, 5 to 8 millimeters from the wound edge as compared to the normal 1 by 1 centimeter uh, that we do and uh, 4 to 5 millimeters apart so this is a recommendation in a article written in South Africa so I think we should actually take heed of this and um, you know don't start doing this on your own um, speak to your consultant in the unit that you're working but I think over time this will slowly become the uh, norm okay there's um, also um, hernias that develop after laparoscopic surgery right we tend to be quite blase about this thinking that it's not going to happen because it's such a small incision but it does happen and this obviously would occur with the larger trochas for example 12 millimeter ports are required when you need to put in the big laparoscopic staplers echelon and all of those things uh, they won't fit into a 10 millimeter diameter troca so you have to put in a 12 millimeter and this unfortunately uh, increases the risk of uh, trochocyte hernias okay um, umbilical hernias are very common and uh, it's important to realize that umbilical hernias complicate five times more often than other ventral hernias right then obviously the mortality and morbidity related to emergency hernia repair like i said just now is much higher as compared to elective right? there's a whole lot of other facts there that are relevant that you should look at right? patients with asymptomatic hernias should be offered repair this is what i was talking about now don't wait until they complicate right surgical expertise has been shown to play a role in the outcome of hernias or recurrent hernias Sorry, your smile's got a question. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, your smile says they are already advocating the small bite closure extensively in the colorectal unit at Donald Gordon. Okay, that's uh, that's very good. Um, I'm sure that will slowly come across. Um, Manish, you having some connectivity problems? Anyone else, anyone else having connectivity problems, let me know. As far as I know, everything is um, streaming okay. Let me just check that. Yeah, everything looks good. Okay, um, just getting back to the expertise. Um, simple hernia surgery can be performed by a surgeon trained in hernia surgery and performing the procedure regularly complex hernias such as high risk uh, where there's lots of domain loss of domain and recurrent hernias should be performed only in units where significant numbers of these cases are performed and the expertise exists okay and uh, the hernia interest group of south africa offers training programs in hernia surgery for surgeons to improve their skills right obesity plays a very big role um, with hernia recurrence and the recommendation is that anyone with a body mass index of more than 50 this is the super obese should not have any inguinal or any hernia ventral hernias repair attempted uh, those with body mass index of greater than 50 uh, than 35 um, can uh, have it done laparoscopically if it is feasible uh, these patients, as long as they're not obstructed, uh, they can be encouraged to go on to a medical weight loss program. This is uh, where you actually get the physicians involved and you monitor the patients very closely. And uh, you must make sure that you do not lose these patients to follow up. Uh, this is uh, very topical. These are the kind of questions they can ask you. And um, you must be um, sure not to get confused. Right? There's not always um, a correct answer. Um, your examiner may not have read this particular article, but you should have this kind of background. They very frequently ask you these combinations, um, whether you would consider 
doing a hernia repair at the same time as a lap coli, for example, because the patient has uh, both uh, conditions concurrently. Right? And the recommendation from this article is that concurrent umbilical hernia repair should be performed during laparoscopic cholecystectomy and the grade of evidence is moderate. Okay, so there's a couple of options here. Umbilical hernia with ascites, fertility and pregnancy. You should have um, a working knowledge of this type of information. Okay, some people seem to be having some connectivity problems. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I, I'm streaming uh, without too much of a hassle. Okay, perioperative management. Um, it's important to assess your patient adequately before proceeding. Um, they should stop smoking at least four weeks prior to surgery. If they're diabetic, their glycemic control needs to be very tight. Um, weight loss, this issue of obesity, which I've mentioned already. Adequately treat any infections. Um, HIV positive patients, uh, according to this article, the uh, risk of uh, recurrence is related more to the nutritional status and the presence or absence of organ failure as opposed to the CD4 and viral load. Uh, but the um, recommendation from the first world is that uh, antiretroviral therapy should be optimized preoperatively. Right, this um, the whole discussion about hair removal prior to surgery, you know that the whole uh, concept of, from the olden times of, well, not that old, um, of shaving the patients. Uh, patients in the past had been uh, recommended to shave themselves at home and all of this has fallen away. Uh, the recommendation now is that shaving blades tend to cause micro incisions on the skin which actually increase the risk of wound sepsis and um, uh, uh, surgical site sepsis. They therefore recommend the use of electric clippers. These are electric shavers which uh, the blade doesn't come into contact with the skin and this however should not be done at home or even in the ward preoperatively it's actually best done immediately pre-op in theater okay antibiotic prophylaxis first generation keflosporin i think we all used to kefazolin um, if the patient is known to have uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, then additional steps should be taken. You can give vancomycin. You can treat the patient with um, Bactroban ointment to the uh, nasal cavity, and you can uh, ask the patient to bath in chlorhexidine. If the patient is allergic to beta-lactams, your alternatives are clindamycin and vancomycin. DVT prophylaxis, um, there's nothing specific to hernias. You just follow the normal... Uh, DVT prophylaxis um, that is used in your hospital. Right, there's a long discussion about mesh, um, also the different types of mesh. Um, importantly, overlap of mesh is very important. The reason for this is that a uh, lot of the artificial meshes uh, tend to shrink and if it shrinks too much, um, there's possibility of recurrent hernia around the edges of the mesh so there must be at least a five centimeter overlap and this means that a one centimeter hernia should have a mesh of seven centimeter minimal diameter this is very important to understand okay then there's the issue of coated meshes versus the plain polypropylene mesh uh, the current um, recommendation is that we shouldn't be putting polypropylene intraperitoneally. If you want to put a mesh into the peritoneal cavity against the bowel, it needs to be a coated mesh, right? And there's a whole lot of modern variations and differences in the coating. Uh, the current um, latest meshes have individual strands of the mesh being coated. Right, um, there's very frequently the occurrence of a inadvertent enterotomy and you're now stuck with a big defect and you don't know whether or not you can use a mesh. 
So the recommendations in this instance are to suture the intestine and return at a later stage to repair the hernia, uh, suture the intestine and continue with an intraperitoneal onlay mesh. Um, and you need you have specialized meshes that can uh, tolerate infection better than others. And then you can convert to an open procedure, repair the enterotomy, and put the mesh into the retro rectus space. Okay, we are running out of time, but um, this is really a very good article. I'd recommend you guys um, read the entire article, 32 pages. I just wanted to touch on this article that was sent uh, to me today. Um, I uh, haven't looked at it in detail, but it has lovely diagrams and it is an explanation of the anatomy uh, for laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. Um, sorry guys, I'm not sure why you're, why you're having, having difficulty with the streaming. <coughs> okay, so we're not going to have too much of time to go through this, but um, you can see there's some very nice diagrams explanations, uh, laparoscopic pictures, and um, if you're having difficulty understanding that laparoscopic approach to inguinal hernias, please uh, take a look at this article in detail. Okay, then the uh, papers. Okay, so just to touch on this briefly, uh, this was the paper one that was written on Thursday last week. Uh, these copies, uh, courtesy of Dr. Ravi Naidu, thanks very much. First question, a 19-year-old female presents with a four-day history of right iliac fossa pain and nausea, but no vomiting. She has a temperature of 37.2 and on examination is tender in the right iliac fossa. You'd think there might be a mass in the right iliac fossa. Okay, first part, this is subdivided into five questions of uh, different value, but totaling 100. Um, A is discuss your pre-operative workup in this patient for 15 marks. B, you decide to proceed to laparoscopy. The appendix is normal. The distal 10 centimeters of the terminal ileum is abnormal. Describe the macroscopic appearance of the terminal ileum. In Crohn's disease, terminal ileal Crohn's disease, and how this differs from tuberculosis. All right, then C, which is a big question for 35 marks, describe the options for further management of the terminal ileum that is suspicious of Crohn's disease in theater with reference to intraoperative decision making. Okay, so this is um, highly relevant. Um, it's a sort of situation you tend to find yourself in. Um, you think it's an appendix, appendix mass, um, it's at night and um, you as the senior registrar uh, elect to proceed and then you find um, a problem because it actually is not an appendix, the appendix is normal and you have a thickened terminal ileum which could be Crohn's disease, could be TB and um, how are you going to decide what to do and what uh, the actual diagnosis is okay then d what are the key features that you would expect to see on the histological report that are likely to conform sorry to confirm your clinical diagnosis of crohn's disease okay so that's fairly straightforward this is now you've already done a biopsy they're just looking for histological information so you should really try and write as much as you can here and E, for 15 marks, write short notes on the medical management of Crohn's disease. Okay, so this, um, I think um, most of you would have prepared for something like this. I don't think you would have been easily caught out by a question like this. Uh, what you actually got to be careful of is in, in this type of question is that you actually have too much of information on hand. And you must answer the questions according to the amount of um, marks that are allocated for 
for each question. For example, uh, you know, you shouldn't be writing three pages on A, and then for C, you only write half a page, right? So the best way to approach this is to actually um, calculate and work out your time. I, I, um, I know I emphasize this point a lot, and um, people um, hopefully do understand it, but it's very important to actually stick to the time. So what you'd actually do is take your three hours, which is 180 minutes, and you divide it by 400 marks, right? The total for this paper is 400. One, two, yeah, four questions of 100 marks each. Right, so you're going to take um, 400 and divide it by 180. Sorry, 180 and divided by 400. I'll just work that out for you quickly on the calculator. It's 180 divided by 400, which means that you have three quarters of a minute, which is 0 0.45 minutes, right? Uh, per. Actually, that's 0 0.45 is less than half a minute. Uh, per mark, right? So if you, for example, take 0 0.45 and multiply it by 15, right? You've only really got 6.75 minutes. That's under seven minutes to write uh, a 15-minute answer. Okay, so you'll get the drift of what I'm trying to explain. Um, if you don't understand this concept, please um, ask me to explain it outside uh, of this tutorial, but it's very important that you actually understand your time and it's um, you're actually using the marks to restrict your time. Okay, and um, for example, the 35 minute question should take you, you've only got just under 16 minutes. Okay, so it seems like um, a lot of time but it's not okay question two regarding the retroviral hiv positive patient describe the role of the surgeon in the management of abdominal tuberculosis um, write short notes on the complications of antiretroviral therapy that may require surgical intervention briefly discuss the diagnosis and management of hiv associated parotid lymph lymphoepithelial cysts what principles should you apply to ensure that an HIV-positive patient newly diagnosed or known by recently, but recently on antiretrovirals has an optimal outcome from surgical management of D.1, emergency surgical operations, point two, elective surgical operations, and three, elective surgical oncology operations. Uh, this was a bit of a difficult question. Uh, a lot of people are surprised by this, but if you actually think about it, this is very topical, very relevant. It's actually related to decisions that you're making on a daily basis. Um, the lymphoepithelial cysts, you may not be seeing um, a lot of these, and um, they may be presenting to ENT, but it is definitely um, uh, falls under general surgery and you should have and understanding of this. Okay, um, I'm just going to stop there with the papers. We've only got six minutes left. I just wanted to touch on the questions I've been posting uh, again. Right, these um, Viva and OSCE questions are fairly difficult to put together. So it uh, disappoints me when people don't respond, don't answer, and um, you'll see that I then usually stop doing it for a while. Okay, then I get motivated again, and I do a couple, and then I see no one bothering to respond, then I forget about it again. So um, guys, I'm not expecting you all to get the right answers. I'm not expecting you all to score over 80%. What I want to just see is that you actually make an effort, right? I want to see you thinking about it, right? I don't believe in naming and shaming people. I'm not going to put up, oh, so-and-so has no concept of this. I'm not going to ever say that. Uh, all these answers come back directly to me. Um, I will look at it, and if I see that there's something grossly lacking, I will try to point it out to you. 
privately. I'm not going to discuss it in the group. And I will actually go through the model answers um, when, uh, when enough people have answered. I want uh, at least half the group, at least 10 people to answer. So of the responses, we've got uh, my model answer and only four people have answered. So we need another six people to answer. Right, but basically this was a laparoscopic photograph taken intraoperatively. Um, can you identify what areas you're looking at? It's a little bit tricky, but this is the pubic symphysis here. We're looking at the left inguinal region. Right, that's the deep inguinal ring there. This is the anterior abdominal wall. This is a pre-peritoneal um, space picture. Right, these are the... Um, testicular vessels coming here, the vas deferens is probably coming from more medially, and uh, the big vessels, the uh, external iliacs and that are in this region, you can't really see them that well. Right, but well, once you've identified that, you should uh, go extensively into describing the critical landmarks. Uh, name and describe the critical landmarks for hernia classification. Right, that's also very uh, relevant to the anatomy and then define and describe the iliopubic tract um, and can you identify important landmarks here that are relevant to the safe conduct of the inguinal hernia repair here they're wanting to uh, wanting you to speak about the triangle of pain and the triangle of doom right so i'm going to give everyone an opportunity to read that article um, that i just looked at just now the one with the nice diagrams right and try and answer this question Right, like I say, I want to see people attempting it, um, not uh, just completely ignoring it. Right, there's a second question posted today on the uh, anatomy of the axilla, which is also very relevant. Just take a look at that question and responses from four people. Right, what are the borders and the contents of the axilla? Right, and once again, the marks indicate how many sort of um, points you should have. So if you have five marks, you should be trying to get around five points. Um, I don't give you a time limit on this. Obviously, there is a time limit in the exams. This is an operative viva question. So I've uh, written a little description here of how the viva is carried out to help you. Um, second question, name and describe the walls of the axilla for four marks. Tell us about the axillary artery, four marks. What are the boundaries of an axillary dissection? Very uh, extensive, there's about four points, two marks each. How can the axillary vein be re reliably identified? And what are the important nerves encountered during the axillary, axillary dissection? And how can they be reliably identified? Uh, these are very typical questions that you can get in the viva. Right? Viva, as you know, um, the examiner can pretty much ask you anything. So you've got to be prepared. Um, your options for answering these questions, some of the uh, answers can be quite tedious. It's difficult to type out on your phone. Uh, you can obviously access this on a notebook or a PC, and that makes it easier to type if you have a keyboard. If you are not keen on typing or trying to enter all the information on your phone, uh, you're welcome to actually handwrite the answers and then just take a picture and WhatsApp it to me directly, not to the group because I don't want everyone copying one another's answers. Um, and then I know that you've done the work. I unfortunately will not be able to mark this uh, in detail, but I will present the model answer uh, during um, the live upcoming live streams. Okay, it's now 8 o'clock. I'm going to have to stop the live stream. Thanks uh, for everyone who's attended. Any questions, uh, please post it to the WhatsApp group. Okay, good night everybody.